10. And again, it's headlines. The number is 215-263-1053-877-894-1053. Joining me in this conversation as well along the way, you will hear from Doc B, who is the music director at iHeartMedia.com. You can go to the website and check him out as well online. Doc B, good to have you in the studio. Good morning, Frankie. How are you? I'm well. Good to have you up so early I am morning. up early, but, you know, I had to come in early to sit with you. Yeah. Dr. Umar Johnson, there's going to be a lot of knowledge. Yes, I had to yes. come soak good. some of this up. Yeah, so I knew this was a brother we needed to have in the studio to get you up at five to be in the studio, but it is all good. And, and there's never a conversation I want to have without engaging the audience, which is most important. So please call in. Uh, the author of the book as well, Psychoacademic Holocaust, the special edition and ADHD awards against black boys. Dr. Umar Johnson, doctor of clinical psychology and certified school psychologist. Let's start there, but I want to play this first. Sure. Um, because let me go here first. Tell us your background. Mm -hmm. Who are you? Mm -hmm. Where did you come from? Mm -hmm. How did you get here from A mm -hmm. to Z? Well, I'm from Aiken, Susquehanna, North Philadelphia. Um, I attended Mead Elementary School. I attended B Virginia High School in Winfield. High school, I went to the Scotland School for Veterans Children out in Chambersburg. Okay. My father was a veteran of the Marine Corps, and back around World Hoorah. War I, Hoorah. Pennsylvania started a school yeah. for the children of veterans, a residential academy up in Chambersburg. And so I was up there for high school. Then I went to Millersville University. A uh, shout out to all the Millersville alum from Philadelphia, graduated in 97, came right back in 98, enrolled in a school psychology master's program, got my master's in 2000, Y2K. Came back to the school district of Philadelphia. I did a one-year internship in the very same schools I grew up in, so that was fascinating. Spent five years with the school district of Philadelphia, then I quit because I saw what was going on as it relates to the school to prison pipeline. I saw too many black boys being diagnosed with learning disabilities, ADHDs, mental retardations, and emotional disturbances that they did not have. So going to work for me was a fight every day because I was being asked to classify kids for special ed placement who had nothing wrong with them. Their only crime was being black and the only sin was they were never taught. And so then after that, I went into private work, working for charter schools, which I still do now. I do a lot of special ed evaluations for charter schools around the city and state. I go to other states. I help train teachers, educational specialists, and principals. And then in 2010, things kind of changed for me. That's when I did the interview in Chicago, and I did a lecture in New York City. And within 24 hours, my life had transformed. I was like a household name out of nowhere as it related to my work in saving black boys. So I've basically been on the lecture scene for the past seven years consecutively and internationally. And I'm probably one of the most, if not the most requested black scholar in America. All right, so we're gonna talk some more about your academic mm -hmm. background in just a little bit. One of the things you did uh, seek to do mm -hmm. uh, was to create an environment for African-American boys specifically, but girls mm -hmm. uh, as well. And your goal was to purchase St. Paul's yes. as an HBCU grad. So sad to see mm -hmm. a, a wonderful institution like that go under. Mm -hmm. um, and you seek to purchase that property to create an environment that yes. was conducive to education, specifically for those who are African American. Talk about that. Talk about the success or failure of that idea. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I want to talk about what the resume background so, would be for someone if that dream is still alive for you to be working at a, a school that you would be interested in running. Certainly. The Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy is a vision that I conceived of back in 2005 when I was assistant principal at a charter school here in Philadelphia. And I had found out by working as an assistant principal that I could affect the lives of children far more effectively as a school administrator than I ever could as a child psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. As a therapist, you might do 40 clinical hours, so that's 40 patients a week. 40! But in the school, you impact 400 every day. So I said, if I'm going to make a living helping children, being a therapist is important, but being an educator is far more important because you prevent the problem before it ever even begins. So it was in 2005 when I really began to take seriously this vision of building a school. St. Paul's became the target uh, campus, if you would, because it was available for sale. It was only $2 million. I had visited. I went there, met with the, prince, the uh, president of St. Paul's, the realty company representing the sale, so forth and so on. And so we tried to raise $2 million very quickly. And I would say the biggest mistake that I made was not starting to fundraise sooner mm -hmm. because I still get 
donations every day. Every time I go to the post office, there's at least a dozen or two there. And most of my donors are repeat donors. They're not one-time donors. But unfortunately, as of last month, I was informed by the realty company handling the sale of St. Paul's that it's been sold. Right. It's been sold to a, a white developer who I believe is going to tear part of the campus down and turn it into a residential area or a commercial zone. They're going to save some of the campus, but St. Paul's as we know it will no longer exist. exist. Right. So now I'm turning my sights and I'm just looking at uh, purchasing a regular day school. Mm -hmm. We're going to start with a day school because you got to crawl Here before you can walk. Not necessarily. Okay. Philadelphia is an option, but I'm looking everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be speaking in Chicago on Saturday, so there's some schools in Chicago. I have a realtor that's going to show me around there. There's some schools in Baltimore I've been looking at. Uh, there was There's really not much in Philadelphia. Let me tell you what's happening, and this happened in Detroit, mm -hmm. because I looked at some schools in Detroit just last week or the week before. Because inner city black America has already been determined to be gentrified. White Americans are coming back to take the city back. So they have to be very careful not to let someone like me purchase a school right in the middle of a gentrification and zone. And when you say somebody like you, you mean what? I mean an African American male who's very unapologetic, is not colorblind, understand what's being done to black folks, and is going to galvanize them around issues that are relevant to our success as a people. So if you're moving black people out of Philadelphia, if you're moving black people out of Detroit, you're not trying to sell the schools back because you have to shut the schools down in order to get rid of the people. So the public school shutdown movement goes hand in hand with the gentrification. Mm -hmm. In other words, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the good schools, they don't show them to me. The good schools, they're never on the list. The good schools are not even mentioned. And then when I bring up the good schools, oh, well, we can't talk about that. That's not on the list. Well, why isn't it on the list? You know, it takes a full community to be a part of that conversation. Yes, yes. You know, this yes. is just not a one-sided yes. conversation. Yes. There are a lot of people that have to be in the room at the table yes. that are either staying silent yes. or understand what is going on. Yes. You see that yes. with this conversation. But it's not as easy as people think. There's 100 schools in Chicago. There's 100 schools in Detroit. But what you've got to realize, those 100 schools that were shut down, the best ones are kept. You can't even touch them. They will show you the worst of the worst, but the good ones you don't get because that's already locked up between the universities, the white developers, and the city. Let's talk about the resume process as well. Sure. When you open your school, here here's a, a, a clip from one of your uh, presentations, and mm -hmm. this is the type of educator that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Right. The Prince of Pan Africanism is in the studio yes, in studio with me, Dr. Uma Johnson. That's a lot of information. Let's yes. start with the first thing. Right. Sexually confused. Yes, ma'am. Um at the Frederick Douglas Marcus Garvey Academy. Well, first of all, let's be clear, legally mm -hmm. you cannot discriminate on the basis of gender or race. So there's no such thing as a child who believes themselves to be homosexual or lesbian. They cannot be excluded from our program, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. nor will they be. Mm -hmm, I get mm -hmm, those mm -hmm. questions all the time. Okay. Will you allow gay black boys to come to your school? Or, or educators. Now with the edu- right, I can't discriminate against the educators either. Exactly. 
However, let yes. me be clear. Mm -hmm. I don't desire that population of educators. Okay. Okay. We have to save black families. And you cannot save black families if you're not teaching black boys how to marry and build families with black women. Let's be clear about something. Only one out of every four black women gets married in this country. Black women have the lowest marriage rate in America. So you cannot, on the one hand, say that I support the black family and I want to see black women happily married to black men and at the same time advocate same-sex relationships. Because fundamentally, it's that's some of what is going to be a part of your curriculum. At no, no, no. School. We won't teach it. No. No, 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 no. What I'm saying in terms of your, your part of the focus of your programs is mm -hmm. to talk about black family images yes, of young black yes, boys. So yes. what I'm saying. Is that yes. your One idea? One of the curriculums is black family. So we want to teach the boys how to be men. How to be fathers. And you don't believe, I'm asking for, the because I can hear the mm -hmm. two million people that are listening right well, no, now. Let me clarify. That you believe, I whether or not. not you believe that a gay man can teach a young black man for that, for the sake of this conversation, mm -hmm. to be a man? Is, how I, Can a gay black man teach a black man how to be a black, man? Yes. I think he might can teach him how to be successful as an adult, but... It depends on your definition of black manhood. Mm -hmm. And part of my definition of black manhood is being successfully married to a black woman. So if you're not successfully married to a black woman, you're not coming to my school to teach my boys anything. Uh, are you clear on that in terms of the sexuality issue for applying to your school? That was the first issue. The second one... Well, again, you cannot discriminate right. in hiring on the base of sexual orientation. So if a homosexual male okay, applies to my school, He'll be interviewed like everyone else. Right. Am I going to ask his orientation? Certainly I am. Okay? And I'm really not interested in having gay men teach at my school because that's not the agenda of my academy. There's a lot of schools out there that are exclusively for gays. There's an all-gay school in Chicago. There's an all-gay school in New York. There's one that's being developed in Atlanta. If you're a gay black male, go teach at a gay school. My school is not for that. We're not pushing sexual liberation. We're pushing the restoration of the black family. All right. We're going to talk about Pan-Africanism yes, as well yes, coming up in just a little bit so that those people who may be hearing this for the first time understand the direction that you're yes, coming from. Yes, Let's talk about the second issue, which... Well, I, let me clarify yes, for five yes, please, seconds. Please. Although I do not support same-sex relationship, I love and care about every black person. This is important to say because I'm a psychotherapist and I have therapy clients who are homosexual. There's no discrimination. He's my brother. I have therapy clients who are women, lesbian, no discrimination. She's my sister. So I need the listeners to understand that although I may disagree with the behavior, I can separate it from the person. Just like you can separate someone's drug addiction from them, you can still love them, but dislike the addiction. Just like a Democrat disagrees with a Republican or a Christian disagrees with a Muslim, but that doesn't mean they hate them. Mm -hmm. I don't hate anybody on the basis of the sexual orientation, but I have a right to stay on my platform, which is that black men need to be married to black men. The second issue, because 59 minutes of freaking yes. out goes by so quickly. The second issue you, you mentioned um, was interracial dating. Yes, that, um, I don't support it. Okay, your thought on that in terms okay. of your resume. As I've, I've, I've yes, and part of, of that is linked to my Pan-Africanism. Part of that goes to the fact that I am a Garvey within the political philosophy of Pan-Africanism. Again, it's about nation building, nationhood, strong black families. You cannot build strong black families marrying other people's daughters. Educated black men, statistically, are more likely to marry outside of their race more than all other men in America as a percentage marries outside of theirs. Black men. Yes, black men. Black men marry outside of their race more than any other man. You cannot say that's purely due to love because what is it about the black man that leads him, the successful black male, that leads him into marriage with women outside of our community? What's wrong with the black women that we have? What's wrong with the black male that choose, based on your definition, yes. to choose to marry outside of their race? Let's then again, here. it all depends on whether you're a nationalist or not. I'm a nationalist, a proud one, which means that I'm looking out for what's in the best interest of black people. That's my, that's my concern. We need men to father our boys and our daughters. 75% of black children are being raised by who? Single black mothers. So how can we talk about we care about single black mothers, many of whom live in poverty, raising multiple children, but at the same time we want to condone black men marrying outside of the race. It's a contradiction. You have to make up your mind. We either want to help single black mothers and we want to advocate strong black family or we want to keep on pushing jungle fever. In the long run, what is the best interest for us? I'm not trying to save the world. I'm trying to save us. 
Chinese have people who are trying to save Chinese. Arabs have people who are trying to save Arabs. Latinos have people who are trying to save their community. Every culture practices an us first philosophy except black folks and that's why we're dead last politically and economically in this country you know you talked about the more successful the black man uh, the more likely he is to yes. marry someone outside their race um you know we hear that conversation particularly as a, a black woman we've had the conversation um athletes i'm just curious as to your your thought on that and it is so prevalent and common and ridiculous yeah. and it gets accepted because the black community is colorblind we have a multicultural consciousness that nobody practices except us because we hate self it's not acceptable for james earl jones or Sidney portier or tiger woods or tate Diggs or cuba Gooden jr to be marrying women who don't look like their mothers is unacceptable it's wrong politically it is wrong because it doesn't benefit us. If anyone wants to know what I think on any given issue, they can probably answer it themselves by asking themselves one question. Does this benefit the black community more than it hurts it or does it hurt it more than it benefit? Interracial marriage, does it benefit us more or does it hurt us? Same-sex relationships, does it benefit us more or does it hurt us? You may be, you, you know, there are those that might say to you that this does not sound any different than what David Duke would say as it relates to... Good question. It yes. sounds very different because David Duke is a white supremacist who believes that white people are intellectually superior to blacks. I don't teach racial superiority. I'm not a bigot in any form. I'm simply a nationalist who knows that my people are in trouble and if we don't do something soon, we may not make it out of the 21st century. We got AIDS. We got miseducation. School to prison pipeline. One out of every four black boys getting a high school diploma two out of every four black men are under some degree of supervision from the criminal justice system only one out of every four black women is getting married we only own less than one half of one percent of all the wealth in the united states how can the people who gross a trillion dollars only own a fraction of the wealth our wealth ownership in this country has not grown one percent since slavery 152 years ago yeah. let's get the resume the third issue of the resume question yes, just to assure sure that we, we've covered them all go right ahead my resume yeah okay the, the, the resume for the oh, application if they want to send a resume yeah <laughs> i'm just asking my degree <laughs> <laughs> you might as well right right it, it but, uh, be because yeah, they yeah. need to know that yeah FDMG Resumes. Anyone who wants to work at the school, they can email their resume to fdmgresumes at gmail.com. Not only do we need teachers, we need secretaries, counselors, nurses, security guards, house parents. Mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm. so there's a whole bunch of positions yeah. that will be available at the school. You don't necessarily have to be a traditional educator. And since it will be independent, you don't necessarily have to have a public teacher's certification or mm -hmm, license. Mm -hmm. what about, but, what, but what about funding? What about funding? Has some of the fundraising... And, oh, we've raised seven hundred thousand dollars so far so that's not a lot of money but we're right on the borderline of being able to get like a nice size and school. you have some some funders and I have some celebrities who shall remain nameless who have pledged unofficially that when I'm ready for their help they will be there to provide it okay you and know, they, and when you're a lot of ready, celebrities support my work they just can't do it in the public okay and so they will be private funders moving that's forward. what they say Okay, that's what <laughs> my guest is Dr. Shout Kuma out to Johnson. all my celebrity friends, my rappers, my uh, actors, and, and, my And I'm athletes. only cu curious, are they all with black women? Yes, would you at least I money, know. Would you take the money from a, a professional athlete who's married to a Yes, I would, because the money for our kids and his talent. Is that not, how is no, that I'm going to tell you why. Because his talent don't belong to him. His talent belong to us. He come from our race. But, so that money has black people's DNA all could, over But you would take his money, but he couldn't work at your school. Bingo. Really? That's I'll right. Just keep it real. 726 is the time. Stephanie from Germantown is on the phone. Stephanie, thank you so much for your phone call. And, of course, looking forward to talking with you. Good morning and welcome to Headlines. Good morning. Amen. Thank you.
Yes, ma'am. Let me say that once we open up the first Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, sister, we're then going to franchise it. So we ultimately have to have them all over the country. And as a Pan-Africanist, I'm going to say all over the world because as someone who's spoken on every continent, I can say that there's no place I've been where African children are receiving the type of education that they need to have. We're going to franchise it. Now, there have been requests for me to put the curriculum out before I build the school, and I'm not mm -hmm, going to mm -hmm, do that. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm not going to do that is your curriculum. It's only as good as the people you have implementing it. It's like a treatment plan in therapy. If I give Doc B my treatment plan, but Doc B is not as good as a therapist as you, it'll look like my treatment plan was ineffective, but the truth of the matter is he was ineffective at implementing it. So it's not just the curriculum, it's having the personnel. In other words, if I have to choose between a good teacher and a poor curriculum, or a strong curriculum and a weak teacher, give me the strong teacher mm -hmm. and the weak curriculum, because she will transform it. But no matter how great the curriculum is, if it's a weak teacher implemented, it will fail. So I have to show that it can work before I can let other people try it because there are there will be attempts to sabotage my efforts. Dr. Uma Johnson is my guest. Um, the uh, vision is the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. Let's talk about uh, this. We're going to take a break coming sure. back, and uh, I'll give you an opportunity uh, to respond to this question. Uh, but you talk about your lineage and your yes, blood lineage to Frederick Douglass. Yes, ma'am. And there are those that challenged you <laughs> on whether or not that's true. They, so hold, hold that thought. You see that picture? I do see the That's picture. We're going to show tree. it online too. My name is on it right, and right, Frederick right, Douglass' name. Go ahead and respond to it before. <laughs> sure, I respond to it. Yes. It's not. It's not a lot of people. It's a couple people who are distant blood relatives of mine who are jealous of my success. Mm -hmm. Period. When you say mine. When you say the Bailey family that has a family reunion every two years that I've been to multiple times. Why is my name on a family tree? Why is my father's name on a family tree? Why is my daughter's name on a yeah. family tree? My my grand uncle who lives here in Philadelphia was part of the historical committee of the family. They know I'm related to Frederick Douglass. They're simply jealous. Let me let me focus on the contention. I'm not a direct descendant of Frederick Douglass. I'm a direct descendant of Stephen Bailey. The same Stephen Frederick talks about in his narratives. Stephen is Frederick's first cousin. Their mothers, Harriet and my five times great grandmother Betty, were sisters. But Frederick and Stephen were also half brothers because the slave master raped both mothers. So what they're saying is he's not a direct descendant of Frederick Douglass. That is correct. But I am kin because I descend through the loins of his brother and cousin. They're playing with words to confuse people. If they put out an article saying that Dr. Johnson was uh, disavowed by the elders of the Bailey family. How could they disavow me if I'm not a relative? Next question. All right, we'll do that next question on the hey, other side ahead. of this book break. He is the <laughs> author of Psycho Academic Holocaust, the Special Education and ADHD Wars Against Black Boys. We're going to specifically, we're going to go in hard yes, uh, on the other side yes, of this break uh, because I want to really take advantage of understanding particularly educating especially in inner cities mm -hmm. the challenges in cities like philadelphia chicago detroit los angeles how tough it is to find a great education where you work and where you live in the neighborhood mm -hmm. and the challenges of literally getting to the schoolhouse door being an african-american young man mm -hmm. and the challenges that you face mm -hmm. we're going to talk about that next with dr umar johnson taking your phone calls at 215-263-1053-877-894-1053 it's headlines on 105.3 wdas the focus as well on the education, yes. particularly of African American boys, and yes. I hope that we get to uh, the point to talk to you sure. as well about what's Brown versus Board of Education a good idea, and we're going to talk about public education moving forward. How yes. good is it today? Yes. Uh, the advent of vouchers. Betsy DeVos, who is the new Secretary of Education, um, worked uh, and watched. Uh, her in Michigan, so I know some of the mm -hmm. initiatives that she attempted to and did yes. implement in Michigan and moving forward what she's going to do from a federal mm -hmm. level. Let me start here and, and talk about uh, first, uh, most African American boys, in particular, which is one of your focuses, yes. never get to experience an African American male. They don't. One, not a lot of male uh, that males that are African American are in education. 
Um, and is that by design? Why is that? And why do most young African American boys have the challenges in the classroom that they have right now? It is definitely by design. Let's be clear, America is a sexist society, but the sexism in America doesn't even begin to compare to the racism in America. One institution where females dominate is public education. 93% of all public education teachers are male and 97% of, excuse me, are female, and 97% of that 93% are white female. So when you talk about the black boys' academic struggle, when you talk about the school to prison pipeline, when you talk about the overdiagnosis of the reading disability and the misdiagnosis of ADHD, what you're really talking about is a disconnect between America's middle-class white female teacher, who's usually racist, and the black boys she's expected to teach. Black boys want to learn like everybody else. They're not different. They're not so unique that school is a problem for them. The problem is the conduit of the learning, and that is the teacher. But in public education, because of their power, teachers have a lot of power. The American Federation of Teachers, the National Education Association, they are the two, two of the largest unions in America. Remember, America has more teachers and police than anything else in this country. So the reason why you've never really seen major educational change is because politicians, I'm gonna say it again, politicians, I'm gonna say it one more time, politicians are scared to talk about making the schools better because they don't wanna step on the toes of teachers because they have millions of votes and millions of dollars. That's why Obama did nothing to change the schools for black folks. Uh, Trump is really isn't gonna do anything to change schools for black folks because you don't wanna upset your teachers union, that's your votes and your money. Until you bring black men into the classroom to teach black boys, they will continue to struggle. Why are black men not in the classroom? Because the schools don't want them there. Why not? Schools, because uh, the public education is a white female dominated institution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has always been that way. It always will be that way. So there's no recruitment efforts? There's there no is no recruitment. Let me change that. Very little recruitment for black male teachers. And if you go to any school district, you know what they're going to tell you? We've been looking for them, but we can't find them. Well, let me say this to every school district in America. If you want black male teachers, call me. I have resumes for thousands of them. They don't want them. But let me tell you what they will do. They'll bring in Teach for America or one of these other emergency teacher certification recruitment programs, and they will find white men from the suburbs who are not educators, who have a bachelor's degree, and they will bring them to Philadelphia and other inner city school districts, give them emergency teacher certs, let them teach black kids, but there's millions of black men with master's degrees and bachelor's degrees who don't have a criminal record, unemployed, looking for a job, who would gladly go into North Philly or Southwest Philadelphia schools and teach, but they're not looking for them. What you're trying to tell me, that a white man cares more about educating a black boy than a black man? So it's strategic. It's strategic. And by design. Systematic, dis systematic bias, systematic discrimination, systematic disproportionality. All right. Dr. Umar Johnson is my guest. The phone lines are open 215-263-1053-877-894-1053. Let's take Sheena uh, from Nice Town, um, raising a son uh, in Philadelphia. Sheena, good morning. Thank you for your phone call. Short and sweet, your question or your comment. so much for your phone call. The phone lines are open. Would love to talk to you. Great opportunity to speak with Dr. Johnson um, as well. Let me go back just for a second mm -hmm. because I want to hit this point. Um, when people talk about your credentials, yes, um, uh, <laughs> your journey through academia, um, and they've questioned uh, your credentials mm -hmm. in relative to being a PhD, and you say what? 
I would say, well, first of all, we're sitting right across the street from the college where I earned my PhD, the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. I'm a doctor of clinical psychology. I graduated in July, I believe it was, of 2012, right after I spoke at an Urban League conference in New Orleans. So I definitely have my doctorate. I have three master's degrees. The first one is from Millersville University. Shout out to Kenny. I just got uh, Ken a text fellow alum from Millersville University. He's one of the superstar basketball players there. Okay, I got my second master's from Lehigh University in educational leadership because I am a certified school principal. And my third master's was also from PCOM in clinical psychology. Two bachelors, also Millersville University in psychology and political science, six degrees in all. And do you feel like, especially since your ascension, that you're more under attack? And oh, does definitely. That, does that Any unapologetic America hates nothing more than an unapologetically African alpha male. You're hated more than the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, any terrorist cell they think is operating. There's nothing more deplorable in this social order than an unapologetically African alpha male. But I promise you one thing, that's how I live and that's how I'm going to die. No one is taking my backbone from me. All right, well, let's talk about pan-African. Yes. Pan-Africanism, that's pretty much fundamentally the Marcus Garvey idea. Marcus Garvey was the greatest of the Pan-Africanists. He didn't invent it, he reinvented it. He would be what Michael Jordan was the basketball. Michael Jordan did not invent the sport. He reinvented the sport. All right, so fundamentally, what does that mean? Explain three, three to Three quick people. points. Yes. Number one, Pan-Africanists, we believe that all people of African descent are one family. Whether you're in North Philly speaking English, whether you're in London speaking the Queen's Tongue, if you're in Jamaica speaking Patois, Nigeria speaking Igbo, whether you're light-skinned, dark-skinned, Muslim, or Christian, whether you pledge this flag or that flag, we are all one family. African family first, and we identify as being African first. Being African is more important than being a Christian. Being African is more important than being a Muslim. Why? Because God made you black. You chose your religion. God made you black. You chose your religion. Point number two, we believe that what is to be done for black people must be done by black people. We do not believe in outside interference or participation in our struggles. Self-determination for all things. What must be done for black people must be done by black people. And the third principle is that as Africa goes, so goes the rest of us. We would say that until black America, black Canada, black Central South America, the black Caribbean, until we play a major role in the political economic regeneration of the mother continent, none of us will be improved because a strong man is strong everywhere and we get disrespected as long as Africa gets Let's disrespected. Let's start on the local level with local politics mm -hmm. and your regional statewide politics yes. and then we'll work our way to your thought on our former president. Uh, when you talk about for black folk, uh, about black folk and the uh, working within the black community with black people, why then, or do you believe that politicians play a role, and is it a positive role, okay. and that we should be at the table as elected officials? First of all, one of the biggest mistakes that black America makes is we elect people who are interested in their own financial agendas, not ours. That's number one. There are exceptions to every rule. We have some great black politicians in the past here, um, Cecil B. Moore and others. Okay. However, until the black community starts financing, until the black community starts financing the campaigns of the people they want to represent them in elected office, they black politicians will never benefit us. As long as black elected officials have to get their campaign finance funding from the Democratic Party, white corporations, white institutions, as soon as they get elected, they're going to carry out the agenda of their financiers. The hand that pays is the hand that rules. Black people vote, but voting is not enough. You have to finance the campaign. Obama carried out a white agenda because he was financed in organized fashion by white folk. And black politicians also carry out a white agenda because they are financed by black folk. We have to keep our politicians honest, and the only way we can do that is by freeing them up from the necessity of needing white folk to finance finance their victories. All right. We're going to be going to the phone lines in just a few minutes. 215-263-1053 is the number. And of course, we'd love to talk to you. Psycho Academic Holocaust, the special edition and the ADHD wards against black boys. Special education. <laughs> you said edition. Edition. Special education. Special education. I'm <laughs> sorry. The special go. education and ADHD wards against black boys. Um, There are you talk about in your book and, and, and you've talked about at your lecture series uh, about the drugging. Oh, goodness. Of oh, and Philadelphia boys. has one of the highest black boy psychiatric medication drug rates in the country. Like, we're one of the top. 
for Adderall, Ritalin, Concerta, Metadate, all these drugs which come as a result of ADHD diagnosis, conduct disorder diagnosis, ODD diagnosis. When did we get ADD? 1980. Was that a coincidence? 1980 is the same year that the CIA dropped crack cocaine off in the black community. They started drugging our boys the same time they started drugging our men. They turned it into ADHD in 1987. Why did they go from ADD to ADHD? Because there's no drug that can make your child pay attention. The drugs can only disrupt brain function and slow the brain down. And, and so now easy. everybody gets the and, drug. And, now, and it's easy. I've always had this discussion with educators and that whole idea of, first of all, the diagnosis, and you have a great perspective on that. We're going to talk about uh, are these diagnoses more likely than not correct mm -hmm. in your estimation. Mm -hmm. um, but then you have a kid who's six or seven. It's a little fella. But then he all of a sudden is 14 and he's standing six foot. And he's been on a psycho psychotropic drug for seven eight years. And besides, I'm not taking it anymore. Mm -hmm. And we want to know why some of our young men mm -hmm. at 15, 16, 17 have decided at this point they're not taking this drug anymore. Mm -hmm. And they've been drugged for seven or eight years. So talk about... Mm -hmm. um, Especially as a, a clinical psychologist. School psychologist with a doctorate in clinical psychology. And, and, and the whole idea mm -hmm. of whether or not you believe that these are proper and correct diagnoses. First of all, if we had more men in the school, there would be no ADHD. See, this is where the sexism comes in. These are women saying that these boys have mental problems because they're too hyper, too energetic. Well, guess what? When a girl goes through puberty, and y'all start developing into women, y'all sleep a lot. Estrogen. When boys go through puberty, we don't sleep. We want to get active. We want to run. We want to chase. We want to tackle each other. Testosterone. The problem is you got boys who have boy needs, who are not disordered, but they're forced to do what? Function in a female-dominated institution. ADHD in black boys is 97% the result of complaints from female teachers and female mothers. It is sexism. He don't need drugs. What he need is a teacher in the class who cares. What are the three R's of education? Rigor, relevance, relationships. Rigor, holding our kids to a high standard. Relevance, making sure the lesson plans matter. And to, be, and to tell you as a former principal, teachers do not spend the type of time they need to spend on building lesson plans. They will use the same ones from five years ago if the principal lets them get away with it. But the most important R is the relationship. When you walk into the class, the child knows within five seconds whether you're, in, whether you're there to make a difference or you're there to make a dollar. How can you say he has ADHD when there's no recess, there's no gym class, there's no opportunity for physical exertion, but you want to say that this boy got a dis disease because he can't sit still? Every five and six year old wants to play. Every five and six year old is a little inattentive and a little hyper. As the instructional leader in the classroom, your job is to keep their attention. And if you can't, you shouldn't be there. And so many black boys who are diagnosed as ADHD, guess what the real problem is? MG. They're mentally gifted. The instruction is too easy. And you can't expect a black boy to sit still when he already knows what you're trying to teach him. Classroom management? Classroom management is a big issue too, but how about effective instruction? Effective, I know teachers who sit behind the desk. If you're not motivated to teach, why will he be motivated to learn? And I'm not gonna put it all on the teachers. Parents play a role because in my opinion, it's absolutely uh, uh, ridiculous that when I go into homes to do therapy, I see video games, mm -hmm. cell phones, HD TVs, but I don't see no dictionary. I don't see no bookshelf. I don't see no thesaurus. So parents are part of this too. A black boy needs a parent who cares and a teacher who cares. If he got both of those, he's going to make it. If he got one of them, he's going to make it. But too often, many of our boys have mothers who don't care and teachers who couldn't care less. Wow. Dr. Uma Johnson is my guest. We're going to line three. Steve from Roxborough uh, is on the line. Good morning, Steve. Welcome to Headlines. Thank you. And I've been waiting on your phone call.
at East Strasburg University, and he was doing great. Excellent. He was doing great. He needed, like, coming up, I had, my, my father lived in a home, so, and I had an older brother, and I went to high school. I had um, black men who taught the class, who controlled the classroom. So I thought the need, I think, listen, these kids need to be taught by people who look like them. Right. And real quick, you said, real quick, uh, Dr. Nash, so I, I, I so agree with you on everything you said. One point that I like to make, and I, when a teacher doesn't have a vested uh, uh, interest in the community, she comes from outside of the community, so what goes on in that community doesn't really affect her. That's she right. Her ball ball, That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Montgomery County, she doesn't care about that, that student or that community. That's right. In order for black kids to succeed, she just needs to come from that same community. That's right. Because that's how the community grows and builds and flourishes. But if I come from 30 miles away, Make my eighty five thousand dollars or whatever it is, and at three o'clock I'm yeah. But you, you, let me, Steve. I get you, and, and let me just because as I'm listening, I get it. But when you want to educate your children, let me tell you something. That whether the young man is in North Philadelphia, South Philadelphia, whether he is in Wilmington, Delaware, or Trenton, and if I am hired to educate this young person, I don't care where you come from. I don't care what your social economic background is. I want to educate you now. So what we're talking about is whether or not somebody is trying to get a paycheck, see, or whether or not somebody is passionate about educating our young black, our young black children. Period. So I'm not going to totally, I'm not going to totally believe that I get what you're saying, but I'm not totally going to continue to buy into this ideology. I do get it. When you worked in a community, and you know, as when we were raised, I'm just about a year or two older than you are, Dr. Johnson. But we knew that Miss Miss Liz on the block cared. We lived in the same community. We went to the same church. If you had older brothers and sisters, they went through the same school that you went to. But then all of a sudden, when we became a lot more socialized and dignified, we started to move into different kind of communities. And we don't have that neighborhood that we have. But I don't care care where you live, what you drive, or what you do, if you come to that schoolhouse, first of all, Dr. Johnson, and believe that Timmy can read. Timmy has the potential to read. No matter where Timmy comes from, no matter what his challenges are, that you're willing to meet him at that schoolhouse door and do the best that you can each and every day to assure that he can believe, that he can read and that he can be educated. I think part of it is that the perception is that when a lot of our young people come to the schoolhouse door, that the, the focus is not assuring that we're going to give them the best possible opportunity to succeed. I totally agree with you, and that's because there's no consequences for poor instruction. A lot of people don't realize this, but teachers have the greatest job satisfaction of any professional in America. Why? Because the unions have contracts with every school district in America that time on the job dictates tenure, not effectiveness on the job. After a teacher has been teaching in Philadelphia for three years, she was guaranteed to have her job for the rest of her life, no matter how poorly she can complete that job, she would have to do something extremely ridiculous to get fired, having sex with children or something to that effect. Outside of that, and you're talking to a former principal, you cannot fire a teacher. What do you believe is the teach. alternative to that? I'm going to tell you what the solution is. The solution is for black people to build their own schools. See, there's certain systems you cannot create. You're not allowed to have your own criminal justice system. You're not allowed to have your own legal system. The government does allow you to have your own educational system. Guess what? We spent $600 million on McDonald's in 2016. Black America spent $4 billion on malt liquor in 2016. $2 billion on Air Jordans in 2016. And black women spent $9 billion on their hair. With that type of money, every black child in America should have an independent school where they get the education that they're entitled to. You know what the problem is? It ain't the white folk. It's us. It's our priorities. How can you spend so much money on things? Things that don't matter while allowing your children to go to a system every day that's the design to do only one thing prepare our daughters for poverty and our boys for prison all right dr Duwa Johnson is our guest and you'll be able to go online as well to wdasfm.com please make sure that this is not going to be your last visit no, uh, no. to headlines you have an open opportunity to sit Thank in you. with us uh, along the way as you look to build your school how far away are you from that vision we're uh, that hoping you have that we get ready to wrap we up have a month. school by this August, and I'm hoping that the first day of school will be August 21st of 2018, wow. which happens to be my birthday, but also the anniversary of the Nat Turner War and the mm -hmm. Haitian Revolution mm -hmm. and the first day of slavery in America mm -hmm. in 1619. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. symbolically, 
have the school by this August 21st, open it up by the next one. Also, want your listeners to know that they can donate by going to GoFundMe.com slash Dr. Umar, GoFundMe.com slash Dr. Umar. And if anyone needs to reach me, they can do it on the website, DrUmarJohnson.com. You can also call me on my phone, 215-989-9858, 215-989-9858. And just a quick plug, I'll be speaking in Newark, New Jersey tonight at the Greater Abyssinian Baptist Church, 88 Lions Avenue, tonight in Newark for Black History Month. Doors open up at 4 o'clock, and then I'll be speaking at Morgan State University My on alumni, Wednesday. Yes, we were talking about that beforehand. Yes, Please say hello yes. uh, to 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 my uh, alma mater. And that's a um, 7 o'clock program on Wednesday, free and open to the public. Good. Wednesday, February 22nd. Sure so sure you can drive time. 90 miles to Newark tonight, or you can drive 90 miles to Baltimore on Wednesday. All right. Now, listen, I want you to go online as well to WDASFM.com and uh, go to my page. You'll be able to hear this entire interview. Uh, in its entirety, and you'll also be able to see a copy uh, of Dr. Umar's book. Um, do you have any other projects in, in the works? Uh, yes, the National it? Independent Black Parent Association. Anyone listening to today's broadcast who would like to help us organize in Philadelphia or anywhere around the country, that's an organization we started in May, and we have about 30 chapters that we're working with now to organize parents in the seven key areas of discipline, special ed, finance policy, social support, homeschooling, and parent advocacy. And then we have the Black Boy and Girl Black College and Consciousness Tour from Atlanta, June 28th to July 12th. It's an overnight tour, 14 days and 14 nights. Leaving we'll Philadelphia? Take, no, leaving Atlanta. So leaving they would have to fly okay, or, okay. Or, or drive. Or they could put them on the bus and we pick them up, me right. and chaperone. So the parents are going to have to bring them. And we're going to be taking them to historically black colleges in Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, and then they also go to significant places in uh, the black experience. We'll be taking them to the National Civil Rights Museum, Oyotunji African Village, Dr. King Center, the Selma African Holocaust Institute, Montgomery, Alabama uh, Civil Rights Museum, George Washington Carver Museum at Tuskegee. So if anyone's interested, again, DrUmarJohnson.com or 215-989-9858. What do you want to share with us before we get ready to end the show? You know, one hour goes by so yes, quickly. I would say the biggest thing for us quickly. as a people, we have to start using our money as a weapon. Black people do not use our money as a weapon. If we organized our finances, we could control our politicians. We could control our churches. We could control the government. We could do so much in our community. We don't have any infrastructure. There's not a black community in America that has its own school, its own hospital, its own supermarket, its own manufacturing sector. Not one. There's a little Italy in every major city. There's a Chinatown in every major city. There's not a black town or a little Africa anywhere in America. So until we organize our funding, we won't be able to change our situation. Our political destiny is on the backside of our financial and, and to that point, before we go, you know, in a number of communities around the country, that conversation is starting. That there was once upon a time where there were hybrids of communities. Like Wall Street. They call, absolutely. Uh, of black communities before desegregation and the like, where there were black-owned businesses. And then they and put black, highways through them. And middle. they put highways through them in most every uh, mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. around the country. Including here. In Philadelphia. <laughs> Philadelphia I'm as well. Black community, one, boom, where there highway. were black hospitals, where there were black businesses and then all of a sudden the highways yeah. just we had the Frederick Douglass Hospital in Philadelphia a black hospital is gone now you've got to come back we've got to finish Anytime. this we never got a chance Anytime. to talk about one uh, last thing yes, every please. Tuesday morning I have a black parent teleconference it's free six to eight parents have any questions about their children they get free answers yeah. the number to that is 857-232-0158 857-232-0158 every Tuesday morning, 6 to 8, and the access code is 870-864-POUND. And I'm going to be able to post that number uh, on my uh And it's on the back of the well. card. Good. And we're going to put that information to make sure if you didn't have an opportunity to write it down, you'll be able to go to my webpage at wdasfm.com, keyword Frankie Darcel. This interview will be there in its 